it's a bit surprising, um, but that might be that because we've been here since December 2012, 2011, I can't even remember now, years ago, <coughs> and correctly, I have spoken on SAP, and now I'm talking about us as a statutory consultee particularly about making consultation work with partners. Now, there was a comment about communication versus processes, and you'll probably find that a lot of my talk today is about communication, but there are processes uh, beneath it. I'm going to cover a little bit about what Kent's <coughs> situation is, Kent's background, um, and it may be that in all the talks that I've given, I usually give an overview of Kent, so everyone knows what Kent's about. <coughs> I'll talk about our partners and the developers and give a summary at the end. Um, you'll note that I've left developers out of A, B and C. Uh, that's not for any particular reason other than that uh, they're a bit special. So I've got numbers up here for 2013 for our major planning applications. Now, I haven't updated this. Uh, I've been a bit too busy. But in 2013, we saw 442 major, major planning applications. But the expectation is that over the next 20 odd years, we're going to see 145,000 dwellings. Now, I did do a sum at one point in time as to what that represented as increase in demand on major applications within Kent, and it's quite significant. The growth rate, as you'll see, most of our consultants are quite happy now. The housing market's opening up. We had 504 <coughs> applications in 2014. And we've been generally working with a number for looking at our process of 540 major applications. But it's not necessarily evenly distributed across our whole county area. We have 12 local planning authorities, and there is definitely a disparity in the way the housing market works or development works within East Kent, West Kent, and Mid Kent. You see, the higher, larger major application numbers are in the middle of Kent, Swale, Mainston, Ashford, Tunbridge, Morley. Uh, Tubridge Morland's represented today, Kate Holland will be speaking of myself, so we're a tag team act. But that um, disparity actually represents a real difficulty because you have different priorities across the authorities, across the districts. Uh, we've had different engagement with them um, as to the level that they wish to talk to us. And then you have others who have SUDS as actually a very high priority. Ashford has a sustainable drainage supplementary planning document. They've had it since about 2005. They're probably one of the first in the country to do so. That's quite a good document. So if we were to look at the um, consultations we've undertaken, since our new role has started on the 15th of April, uh, we have received 59 applications across all of those districts, including KCC, because we consult on schools and waste applications. Eight of them probably shouldn't have come to us at all. So we had 51 um, in March, April, and May. And you can see how, how varied it across the districts. We estimated that we would need two full-time employees to undertake that work. But that was based purely on just saying that we would have one consultation, initial consultation, that we would be receiving from the local planning authority. To date, that's really occupied probably by one FTE. Um, and the rest of us in the team have been I guess filling in, doing other types of pre-out discussions, talking about policy with councils, talking about policy with developers, talking about policy with the EA. Um, but the available time we spend on a consultation is affected by whether they've had pre-out, what type of consultation it is, whether it's an outline, a full, full application, whether they're starting to talk about adoption and maintenance early on, sometimes that can actually confuse the issue and make things very difficult to uh, come to a satisfactory sort of path forwards. But we also get unnecessary consultation. Um, unnecessary in that it's not major development, uh, unnecessary in that it might be not major development, but there has political uh, sensitivity to it, which has happened on a couple of occasions, which makes our life difficult. So going forwards, um, it's still a little bit hard to predict what the demand on our services are going to be and how they're going to, to work. It's a bit early, early days, I think. Uh, but things have been working well. We are currently operating on an Excel spreadsheet to track our consultations at the moment. We're not going to be getting our proper software that sits beside our other internal software until after July. But we'll make do as we go along. So that's where we're coming from. We've been quite active. Um, with everybody, I think. We try to get out there and talk to everybody as much as possible. And I think the key question you have to ask yourselves is, actually, what do our partners want? 
So you have our 12 local planning authorities, and their three key questions very specifically were really to do with what do we validate, how do we validate it, what do we ask for, and what do we put in our planning list, and what's this thing about maintenance that um, we were being required to look at, because it's the LPAs who were required to ensure maintenance. We had the Environment Agency, who are very good partners. Um, they were clear to sit down and say where their lines of responsibility stopped and where ours start, and they are always offering help and assistance, which I greatly appreciate. Then we have the sewage undertakers, which are a bit quieter on the, on the home front. They're mainly concerned about where things connect to and whether there's land drainage being contributed to their system. They are a difficulty. Then you have the IDBs. We have four within Kent. And usually their specific question is, does it affect their catchment? And they will have interest even if it doesn't connect to their drain or sewer or ditch or whatever that it is. If it's within the catchment, they'll have, have a word to say. And then you have highways authority, and they're quite explicit. How does it affect my highway? They're quite focused on what they're wanting to deliver. And then you have house builders, which I think uh, are probably not necessarily interested in the day-to-day -day running of things normally. They just want to know what they have to do. So that's where the process portion of it comes in. So you have a lot of communication with all your partners, but you need to have clarity of process because at the end of the day, you need to be able to direct or tell somebody what they're going to have to submit with the planning application. So I'm going to go over planning authorities quickly because uh, Kate will talk more specifically about the LPAs. But all of those questions that they are asking are about process. We were at a uh, workshop recently. Um, Steve Wilson was giving his normal substrate education thing. And he said to the, the planners who were around the room, what are you most concerned about? Does this concern you? And the uh, chap his hand up said, no, he said, it's just adding another statutory consultee to the list. We assess all these different matters when we assess the planning application. This is just another matter to consider. From my point of view, it's about communication and it's making sure that the planners do understand what our issues are enough sufficiently that they can look at their options especially when they're looking at a planning application at a pre-application stage. It's also about us agreeing an approach, a process of how we're going to take their planning applications and how we're going to provide a response to them in 21 days. And it's collectively agreeing sort of priorities across Kent because we have 12 LPAs, we're not going to have 12 different processes, we're going to have one approach. So we've been working quite a lot with the Kent Development Control Officers Group, a lot of counties have these groups enables, they usually meet once every two months or so, enables uh, uh, discussion and arguments about particular points of processing in the planning applications. So we've been also looking at training, um, that such training of planners, but we are starting to become very sensitive to the fact that we ourselves need planning training and planning input because we are mainly engineers and don't really necessarily have a proper understanding of what does a planner do. The third thing that's been raised quite a bit is the idea about co-location, having someone from the local fire authority sit within the district council. And if you remember back to that table at the beginning, there's a definite uh, what's the word, uh, greater interest in some authorities having somebody on board and others who've only had one application in the last you know, two and a half months, I don't think they'd be much interested. So that's something we'll, we'll pursue. Okay. I've lumped our sewage undertaker, our highways, and our IDBs together because this is really mainly about infrastructure. They're more focused on making sure their system works and that any new development doesn't interrupt the way their system works. Specifically with highways, um, we have a very good, I think, open highways team. They were very keen to have an interim drainage adoption regime. They published one back in January 2012. Um, and we had some pilot schemes come through. What we're finding now is we're struggling about coordinating our responses. They are providing highways response as the highways authority. We are providing responses as the local flood authority. They don't necessarily conflict, but they create issues which are quite substantial in some cases. Well, not necessarily <coughs> substantial, but annoying. For example, a ditch at the front of a, a development site didn't get picked up as the local flood authority comment. Um, they approved the highway crossover for the access and it's been constructed in a way that we'll now probably have to do an enforcement under ordinary water course enforcement. So there are some things like that that are just holes 
um, there's no joined up thinking that we need to address. In addition, we've been looking at our adoption ability um, and we've been challenged on this in that two years ago we decided we would widen, we would adopt things that had highway and non-highway water in it. We would adopt swales, we would adopt house anyway, and so forth. But we've got this little bit of a, a problem that my discussions at pre-app stage or in consultation stage on adoption may have an impact on how the highway is adopted. So I'm having to pull my agreements team engineers in earlier, um, costing them money, <coughs> they do charge for the time, and it's just creating a bit of an issue as to actually how do you get something that's agreeable from both the highway's perspective, because they can be quite, uh, I'm not saying blinkered, okay, but maybe focused on what their authority or responsibilities are. Um, but, but again, that's an internal issue that's creating problems. There's also a degree of uncertainty in what the receiving system is, and this has created, again, um, a difficulty, especially with sewage undertakers. We had a funding application that came through recently um, where the sewage undertaker was saying there were no capacity issues, and yet the local residents were complaining bitterly about local flooding. And the planner said, how can I go to committee and say, that there are flood issues when I have a written piece of paper from a sewage undertaker which says there are no problems. So that's a problem and I'm not quite sure how we get over that one. Um, communication works to some degree, but when you don't get, I think, clarity or transparency on the other side, particularly when it's a commercial company, it makes it very difficult to understand where they're going in their policies with adoption. UK Water have had certain um, approaches to what they want to adopt, but we're not sure exactly where that's heading at the moment. So we have to assess that on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's time-consuming. There are different options. One is to actually <coughs> sit down with our sewage undertaker, who we have two within Kent, one more than the other, but to develop some sort of protocol and understanding. So we're very clear when we're promoting a swale within a, a development, which isn't lined and has the potential to take land drainage, it's very clear that they won't adopt it. But in other, place, other places they may do, but in ours they won't. So we just need to have a very clear understanding of what their, <coughs> their constraints are. The other option is to wait for government to sort it out, but I think uh, we might be waiting a little while for that. Um, Environment Agency. They've been very good in our neck of the woods. Um, we have EA staff on secondment to help us with the application process at the moment, or review of applications. Uh, we defined a matrix, sat down with them and said, this is where we're going to comment, this is where we're going to comment. Um, we also have an informal agreement as to planning applications that have been submitted prior to the 15th of April and not yet been determined, create a bit of a problem. Mr Pickles, when he was in post, was very clear and said, well, that's actually a current planning situation, is that it should be determined under the current planning policy, which means the Legal Local Flood Authority should provide further comments. But if the EEA has been working on the site for the last two years, it's not really in our position or our place to come in and make additional comments. So informally, we've agreed in our region that the EEA will provide comments and continue to provide comments, and that includes discharging conditions. But it's on a case-by-case -case basis again, because there are some that planning horizons are still going to be going on for another 10 or 15 years, so we will pick those up as we need to. We've been doing a joint act with the EA, we go to the LPAs, and we talk together um, from the EA and the Legal Flood Authority perspectives, and that's worked very really well. One thing that's become quite clear, and this is in relation to critical drainage areas, there's a, an allowance within the Development Management Procedure Order, um, which made us a consultee, that the EA will be a staff consultee on critical drainage areas. We have no CDAs in care. We have a couple of areas that should be, but they're not. And what we're going to be looking to do in the next while is define these things called areas of high local flood risk, which mean that there are areas that might need consultation and it might only be one house. And it might be in our best interest for everybody for that to be looked at from an engineering perspective. Um, if it's in an area of high local flood risk, they will give us the opportunity to have a comment on it. Something that needs to be agreed with the local planning authority, needs to be something that's gone through public consultation, and it's very clear where those areas are. But it's a tool that we're looking to use to ensure that those really horrible little sites that get water in them and actually proposed for development, someone's actually paying attention to them. So I come to developers. 
Uh, we've got five minutes to talk about volunteers. Mm -hmm. What do we need? What do they need to do? Well, it would be nice, this is a sustrain photo, it would be nice if they had some nice swales or natural areas through their development. They're required under the development management procedure order, our role, and I've decided to write this down because you need to be quite clear about this, we are consultees for major development with surface water drainage. There are no specific rules. There's nothing out there that specifically <coughs> says you need to do this to ensure that major development with surface water drainage gets the best that it can do under consultation. And it's what happened was there used to be the national technical standards, which were 12 pages long, and then they were five pages long. And then they had 40 pages of guidance behind them. And they were quite explicit and they had planning as well as technical requirements. They lost some key matters. They lost biodiversity, they lost by immunity, and they lost water quality. So they lost things, but they brought everything together. And when they put it into the planning process, DCLG decided that there was overlap. You couldn't have a decision made on two types of regulation. So they took all the planning regulation out. So technical standard number one, which talked about don't build an areas of progress, something like that, was taken out because it's covered by paragraph 100 of the National Planning Policy Framework. And all that section on water quality, which was national standard in the middle somewhere, it's actually covered by paragraph 109. So DCLG butchered the national standards and gave us the non-statutory technical standards for sustainable drainage. And they are purely engineering standards. They're purely about performance. One in a year, one in a hundred. Just, just the hydraulic performance or the flood perspective or the maintenance. It's, it's nothing extra. And the difficulty we have then as a legal local flood authority, we've actually got to look at something beyond the technical standards. That's not the only thing that we measure. So I come to what my view, or Kent's view, of the consultation is. And this is, I'll point you to a document Sustrain had um, sent anyone, everyone an advertisement for this last year. It's the Planning Advice for Integrated Water Management. It was produced by the Cambridge Natural Capital Leaders Forum. It's quite a good document for planning. Um, but there was one diagram in it that I think sums everything up. Water is managed from four different perspectives. It's managed through the National Planning Policy Framework and the plans. It's managed through the Water Framework Directive with River Basin Management Plans. It's managed through the Water Acts, so the Water Resource Management Plans from our water companies. And also the Flood and Water Management Act where we, produce, where we have to produce surface water management plans. The Lead Local Flood Authority has, now I've, I have to be very careful here because I would immediately say duty and I've been corrected to say it's not a duty that we have towards local flood risk. We look after local flood risk. That's what we've been given under the Flood and Water Management Act. But we do have a duty with respect to biodiversity. Hmm, that's somewhere else. And we have a duty to uh, coordinate with the EA and river basin management plans. Hmm. And we also have a duty in relation to you know, water supply and how we work with our sewage undertaking partners. So when we get a planning application, we're not just looking at it from the technical standards or the non-statutory technical standards. We are the LFA. We actually have to consider all of these other matters in the way we look at a planning application. And in working with our partners within the planning process, it's useful and efficient and beneficial for them for us to give them comment on that wider framework that we have involvement with. So, to that end, to be clear and to enable to have a transparent process, we've produced, I don't know if you can see it, drainage and local flood risk policy statement. It's supposed to go out for public consultation on Monday. It was supposed to go out last Monday, but got pulled up because um, I actually hadn't attached it to an email, which I'd sent to my director, a bit of a mistake. Um, but within it, it has technical standards, which is a narrative, really, of the technical standards within the non-statutory technical standards. But it also includes wider policy. So policies one to six uh, encapsulate the technical standards, but probably add a little bit extra. So, um, for example, mimicking natural flows and range flow paths. I'd actually like to be clear to our developers we want to retain natural features as much as possible. Seems a little sense about that. Um, we talk about making sure, well, actually, if there's an opportunity to manage flood risk from the wider catchment, 
and we can work something out, well, maybe we should encourage you to do that. That's within the law. Um, but it makes it clear that there's two different strands. So one to six are technical standards which I think we can object to. If they don't comply with these, they don't deliver those, it's quite clear that they'll have an impact on flood risk. I can say, I object. However, I can't object to the ones on the right within water policy because I do not have regulation that supports me to talk about water quality or amenity or biodiversity or landscape. I can, however, make suggestions. So if I get a tank with hydrobrake in it, which I don't like, but which manages flood risk, I can say, you're managing flood risk. I don't object on those grounds. There's no flood risk resulting from this design. However, you've lost any opportunities to enhance biodiversity, and I would recommend the local planner assess what this provision is within his plan. So it's a recommendation to my partner at the local planning authority to say, look, you should look at this. So that's the way we are heading. When um, we look at what we require to do when we're asking a developer to do, we haven't provided a list. We've just made a statement that they must demonstrate that the drainage stream, drainage manages flood risk. We've not specifically made a list. I mean, I pinched this from Enfield, but I thought it was quite nicely a list. <coughs> um, I might put it somewhere, but um, my problem is that a lot of our sites have lots of variations in what they have within them and within their scheme. And we do have a page which has two lists on it, but it's always dependent upon the applicant's professional opinion. <coughs> So, I come to, this is my second last slide. Um, I just want to give you an example of where we've got to. Um, we are trying to work with our developers to make them think in the right way, provide us information early on, consider all matters early in the process of their <coughs> Last week we got called into a meeting with uh, Dover District Council. This is a, I, you may have different views of the way this layout is. But this guy got a gold star from me for the first time he put the, bond, the pond at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> and he actually thought about it. And the interesting thing was this was a conflict over provision of play space. Being at the bottom of the hill wasn't actually a good place for the play area. Um, it was out of sight, there were security issues and there were access issues. And so we were working with the planner to try and come up with a different solution, a different solution to the sustainable drainage feature. I was going to lose the reef bed. Um, because we came up with some other suggestions. Engineering-wise, those aren't going to work now. But it's this interesting conflict or difficult conflict between the land provision and the way the land is used. So, I mean, I just thought we got somewhere with this chap. You know, he'd come in, he'd come to talk to us, and we're not there yet, it's not finished, they've not submitted, but um, we're on our way. So, in summary, we all require communication. Communication is is probably the major underpinning of it all because you need to express what's required, you need to talk people around their issues, you need to persuade and influence. There are different expectations amongst all the different partners, but you have to be clear about what's required. You know, so I've said I've not put a list out for developers, but part of that is to try and not hem them in in what I'm asking, but also make sure that the, you know, it's wide enough that they're going to, to give us what we need. I got to the end, and this actually made me think of Lost in Space, um, because I felt like, well, actually, maybe I should have used, um, was it, Brave New Frontiers, I can't remember what the TV show that was, but um, I was thinking about the robot, because we are in a new place now, this is a new role for us. In the last couple of weeks, I've spoken spoke to Tony Paul from Bradford, and, and they have current problems at the moment on some things that are happening with the way some conditions were really. And that's probably our greatest danger. We can do the consultation, it's not a problem. We can provide our advice, it's not a problem. But it's how we communicate our requirements to the planners and how those are written down in planning application approvals. If you can write a condition that says X and they can object to it and you can end up in appeal in front of the Secretary of State, we're, we've got a problem. And because this is new, we're going to be facing that, I suspect, sooner rather than later. And it's whoever's going to be first up to Secretary of State will be setting the example on how you write a condition and don't write a condition. We have standard conditions that have been in use for the provision of drainage strategies for a number of years. And I'm actually wondering if they are possibly are at risk. So that is something that we, on the engineering side, 
the table <coughs> to make sure we talk to our planning partners because they're going to have to deliver it and ensure that our decisions or the decisions they make based on our advice is solid and sound. Yeah, thank you.